Well, I'm supposed to introduce somebody that uh, all of you know already. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's, a, it's, a, it's an honor to introduce Boris. Always is an honor to introduce Boris. I've done this before. <laughs> uh, some of you may know that uh, during World War II, Boris served as a medical technician in the Army and uh, as a youngster. And then as soon as the war was finished, he came back, he came to this country, he came back here. Actually, he'd been here before. And he grew up in Europe, but uh, he came here in, uh, in the uh, early 40s. And he enrolled uh, at, uh, at Columbia as a PhD student uh, after the war, and received his PhD at Columbia in 1949 working with Erwin Chargoff, who was one of, the, uh, one of the giants in the field of biochemistry at that time. Uh, and then he came to Harvard uh, in, uh, in 1949, and uh, advanced up the ladder at Harvard and became a faculty member, uh, a, very, uh, a very active faculty member at Harvard and uh, somebody that uh, uh, a lot of people would like to have recruited away from Harvard, including us. Uh, I, I arrived here in 1954 uh, as uh, when the department, when the MIT actually, the administration of MIT, had decided to strengthen biochemistry in the, in the biology department. And, uh, and uh, we, we, we decided uh, in the mid 1950s, uh, that uh, it was a very small department at that time. I think I was the 15th faculty member in the department when I arrived here in 1954. Uh, we decided at that time that, uh, that if we wanted to make, an, to, to make a, a mark in the biological sciences, that uh, the, the department ought to be strengthened in the fields of biochemistry, genetics, and microbiology, because it looks to us as if the breakthroughs were going to be made uh, in uh, studying biology at the molecular level in those fields. So uh, we decided to, to go ahead and try to recruit in those areas. And we were fortunately able to recruit uh, Salvador Luria uh, in the late uh, 1950s to, uh, to come here. And uh, of course, he was a giant in microbiology and genetics at the time, and a little, somewhat later received the Nobel Prize for, for his work. And uh, Salva uh, was instrumental in, uh, in our recruitment policies and trying to, uh, try to recruit Boris. And so we were able to convince Boris to come, to, uh, come across the river, join this department, uh, in 1960, and with with that one fell swoop, we were able to strengthen the department in three different areas: <laughs> biochemistry, <laughs> genetics, and microbiology. And <clears throat> Boris continued uh, continued his work, uh, uh, and primarily in the area of uh, the genetics and the biochemistry of uh, nitrogen metabolism and microorganisms. And in 1967. Uh, uh, he became department head and remained department head until 1977. And during that period of time, that 10 year period, the department grew very rapidly in terms of uh, faculty, in terms of students, PhD candidates, undergraduate majors, uh, to the point where uh, by the time uh, after his 10 year period as department head, the department at that time was rated is one of the best, if not the best, biology department in the country. Uh, with those ratings that came out, we were always either at the top or second or third, or tied for first, second, or third in the country. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Boris certainly did inhibit that, and he, uh, and he certainly had a big hand in, uh, in allowing the department to be uh, to come to that uh, degree of, uh, of excellence. So it's, a, it's an honor to be able to introduce Boris at this time. You have to say, I'm going to say something too. Oh, I can say <laughs> 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 <laughs>
thank you very much for the introduction. What uh, Jean didn't say is, and it's in a little paper some of you might want to pick up, and you can make more copies of it, that uh, I published in the Journal of Bacteriology, uh, which deals with the changes that happened in the 1950s. That was the big turnover, 1950. And uh, around that period, it is up to then, you bacteriology, microbiology, was taught in medical schools or in schools of agriculture. When uh, the, as an extraordinary step, I think in 1953 or so, Harvard invited Cloyver and Van Neel. Cloyver was from Delft in Holland and was one of the great microbiology departments. And Van Neel had many students, and by that time was in California, to give the Prada lectures, which is a very distinguished lectureship of five lectures at Harvard. They were specifically warned not to expect that anybody in the audience knew anything about bacteria, <laughs> because it was just not taught. In schools, there was zoology and botany. And bacteriology was somehow completely off. And it was then what happened in the 1950s, and Luria played a very big role in that, that suddenly put bacteria into the center of molecular biology, which then developed, because it was then clear cut that if you wanted to do effective experiments in genetics, it was a big advantage to have an organism that had uh, could grow uh, with a mass doubling time of less than an hour, like E. coli. You can really could then isolate mutants, you could do experiments. And they, so the two great discoveries then were number one, that you could use bacteria that way because they had a normal genetics and they had mutations. And there was a Luria Dalbrook experiment that showed that mutations were not that uh, when you get got a drug resistant or phage resistant mutants, this was not the phage of the drug that did it, but the chance mutations, mutants that were present in the population. So it was one important experiment. And of course, the other experiment was the Avery experiment of bacterial transformation, showing the DNA addition to uh, pneumococci could change the genetic character of the organisms. So these were the great things that happened in 1950. Uh, sorry, in the 1940s, before 1950. And at that time, as Gene already mentioned, the MIT administration, and particularly uh, influenced by the physicists here and so on, realized that MIT had to get into this new way of doing biology. And so the important appointments that were then made were Salva Luria, which was a big coup because he certainly was one of the leaders in that field. They also had then a very good physicist who had turned into biology, Cy Leventhal, who did some very important genetics. Vernon Ingram came at about that time. Alex Rich came about that time. So it was a complete change and a completely new way of looking at biology. And MIT was at an enormous advantage because it wasn't encumbered by having classical zoology and botany. Harvard, for example, was not able to make the change, basically, because the entire department of biology, I don't even know whether they had two departments and not just one, was zoology. Botany, and okay, I mean, they were not, uh, they tried to hire uh, Jim Watson, but that didn't work very well. He was there only for a short period of time because he was completely alienated by an entirely different culture. So it was then really at MIT that was open to it, that had a biology department. There were students interested in biology, there were physicists and chemists interested in this new way of looking. And then with Luria coming, and then these other appointments being made, it started the department. So I just wanted to say that and kind of finish up what Gene started as an introduction, and then uh, let's talk about things. <laughs>
So if you have questions, start answering questions, make suggestions or anything. So what was it that attracted you to move over? Well, essentially, uh, mostly the fact that uh, there was this new thing going on. At Harvard, it was very fun, but I was in a, a medical school department. It was a very good one. I might even want to say something about it. Uh, the head of the department who brought me to Harvard was John Hart Mueller, who's been now almost forgotten. But he was really, uh, although he was modest, so it never stood out, a towering figure. He had discovered the amino acid methionine. It was the last amino acid to be discovered. And in 1920s, he discovered it as a growth factor for bacteria. So it was a completely new way, and he was absolutely conscious of this. He wrote, then as a very young man in his paper, that bacteria were known, you know, they were cultured in medical school departments, and they had was clearly to try to give them a medium that was similar to what they would encounter in patients. So they grew them in complex media, and he pointed out that if you really analyzed what in this media, you would recognize new, as yet unrecognized compounds that played a major role in biochemistry, biology. Uh, it also tells you something about the time when Mueller uh, was then in New York at Columbia, and the Zinser, who was a kind of big shot working on viruses and so on at Columbia, became head of the department of bacteriology and immunology at Harvard and took Mueller along. And the power of department heads in medical schools was then such that he simply told him not to work on bacterial nutrition. It was totally unimportant. You should do some good immunological experiments, which Mueller had to do for a number of years. And then he finally felt uh, strong enough to get back to nutritional studies. By that time, he had missed some important thing because other people, Snell particularly, who was then gene supervisor at Texas, had gone also into bacterial nutrition. It was not the entirely new field that he had discovered. And uh, so then Mueller, when he became head of the department at Harvard, had the absolute rule that nobody would work with him. He did his own work, period. He came in at 5 in the morning or so, that gene. <laughs> and had one technician as head of the department and did his work. And so I was lucky to then become a faculty member there because when people wanted to work with Mueller, who came, he simply told them to work with me. <laughs> so for a young man, you know, who's unknown, <laughs> it was a good start. But uh, that's kind of the history of this. And then, of course, we're coming back to MIT. At Harvard, uh, there was the mix of graduate students, were good graduate students, had very good graduate students, and medical students. And MIT, there was the potential mix of equally good graduate students and undergraduates. And not that medical students aren't very good. But I mean, their aim is so specific. After all, they want to become physicians. So it doesn't, didn't for me to make as interesting a mix as MIT, where there would be graduates and undergraduates. So it was really more attractive for that reason also to come over. And then the whole fact that it was a new venture, in particular at Luria, uh, was uh, really clearly one of the outstanding microbiologists. And so we could do something good. And he definitely wanted, and I could help him in that, to develop good teaching of microbiology in the department. OK, can I say anything else? Well, was, was it also because of the administrative structure at the medical school, whereby only MDs would rise through the ranks? It, that was really not true in the preclinical departments. In the preclinical departments, it was mostly PhDs. I mean, Mueller himself was not an MD. Uh, Hastings, who was then head of biochemistry, was not an MD. Uh, so that, there was not a prejudice in the preclinical departments that way. So it was mostly the mix of students. Mm 
Morris, one of the things I remember you saying a number of times, I think, was that what made a major difference in the field of bacteriology and biology was the idea of the uniculture and simplifying things so that you actually had something to analyze. In that context, I'm curious to know your views, not of the past, but rather of the future. So that today, there are many catchwords that people use, and, and in fact use in a diversity of ways. One of them is systems, another is translational, another is interdisciplinary, and then interfaced with all of this is big science as contrasted with small science. What are your views about all of the above? But I'll start, I'll start. I don't know that I'll be able to say anything to all of the above, but I'll start with the last one, which is much under discussion now. And I think uh, certainly in my whole experience, as long as I was doing research, uh, the existence of small science is that individual investigators could get grant for NIH, from NIH for problems they wanted to carry out was of an immense importance. And I think the tendency of trying to downplay that and to rather have big grants that encompass many things and then can attract people to have it organized that way, I don't think makes up for it. Because uh, sure, there are advantages to complex structures. And I mean, one of the great uh, achievements in our department of uh, lawyer was uh, in the 1970s of coming up with the idea of the cancer center. The cancer centers were established at medical schools, but his idea that you could have a cancer center at the university that does not have a medical school and would play its own role was certainly extremely uh, important. But Salva, even then, when he planned the uh, cancer center, I, although it was supported, I think, then from a large grant, I don't know whether it still is from a large overall grants from NIH, also had individuals get grants, and individuals being independent as faculty members and responsible for their own destiny. So I think the small science of grants is definitely a very important thing. Then the first question that you asked is about uh, systems which are very fashionable nowadays. And I think I talked to some of other colleagues in microbiology in the department and we kind of all a little bit puzzled because we thought we had always worked with systems. <laughs> But I mean, it's a good word. It can, <laughs> it can, it can encompass more. It, it creates the idea that people up to then had worked on very little specific problems that had only context within themselves and were not related to other things. And that's obviously not the case. And Morris, so, one of the things I've heard you do just to place things in a broader context is to uh, trace your connection to Pasteur, and I thought maybe that might okay. be an interesting. Uh, I, I, I think what, I didn't. I don't think that Graham would remember it, but <laughs> I, but I, I, it's it's my illustration that uh, number one, uh, science is very young. That's one way of looking at it. The other way is that people live fairly long. Uh, so uh, human lifetimes overlaps many things. And I think what Graham had in mind was that I did my doctorate with Irvin Shargov. And Irvin Shargov, when I was there in the uh, 19, late 40s, uh, was quite a young man still. He was probably in his late 30s or early 40s. And he had been for a short while in the 1938 or 39, get fleeing from Germany in Paris at the Pasteur Institute. And the head of the department at the Pasteur, the head of the Pasteur Institute at that time was Emile Roux. And Emile Roux had been a collaborator of Pasteur 
So you see, by knowing Sharia, and as I said, it's not even that uh, relatively recent. It's already a long time ago, and Sharia only died very recently. I can trace a direct line to Pasteur, because Sharia <laughs> knew who, who worked with Pasteur. It, if you really want to uh, go back a little bit further, Pasteur did his important work in the 1960s, 70s. And 1860, sorry, 1860, 1870. And he almost certainly knew when he was a student, Gay Lussac. Gay Lussac had done really the first absolutely accurate work on bacterial fermentation, showing that uh, you got two molecules of lactate in the lactobacillus. Uh, and, or one, two of ethanol and two of CO2 per molecule of glucose. And that was repeating an experiment, experiment of Lavoisier. And whether Gay Lussac personally used Lavoisier, I don't know. But the bridge is not a very long one. <laughs> he almost certainly knew someone who knew Lavoisier. And so on. So, I mean, it, it, we, we are tracing back to uh, the late uh, 18th century very quickly, really to the beginnings of science. Just that uh, reminds me very much, I have an elderly friend who lives in Stowe, Massachusetts, who's an excellent pianist, studied in Vienna, and uh, he plays uh, Ernest Goldman, I think uh, Shirley knows him, and he traces his lineage in just two, two generations of teachers of Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think our whole civilization, if you want to look at it that way, is fairly young. I mean, we're tracing things back very quickly to uh, people that we consider the giants and the beginners of their fields. What drew you to science in the first place? Uh, I don't know exactly. I think the fact is that my uncle, who I didn't know very well, my father's younger brother, was a chemist. Uh, but uh, it was kind of complicated because I was still born in what I thought was Russia. It turns out to be Ukraine, Kharkov. Uh, so my, that was during the uh, Russian Revolution. So my parents left at that point when I was two years old and we moved to Vienna, in Austria, where she had relatives, my mother had relatives and so on and so forth. And during the time my father grew up in Russia, it was very hard for Jews to go to the university in Russia and so on. So his younger brothers all went to university in Germany. So that's before the First World War. And uh, so the younger brother uh, became a chemist, was a physical chemist but then moved to Israel before Israel existed. It was still a British mandate after the First World War, and worked in Weizmann, with Weizmann, who was a chemist, microbiologist, at the beginning of what became the Weizmann Institute in, in Israel. So I only knew this uncle on rare visits when he came to Vienna. But anyhow, there was a chemist in the family. So it may have influenced me. The teaching of, when I was in high school and gymnasium, the teaching of chemistry was abysmal. <laughs> but we still did, for one year only, or something in the whole eight years, but we still did some experiments with a friend. Of course, with explosives. <laughs> until, until he blew up. I'd like, I'd like to break in and just mention that Forrest could easily have been a historian, I'll tell you, because he, uh, he, loved, he knows history, more, more history than... than uh, than any of us know. Yeah, all of us put together, probably. That's probably an exaggeration, but even <laughs> so, uh, Gene's right. My best, uh, uh, when I went to secondary school, gymnasium, my best field was history, and it was interested in both. But I don't know that has something to do with, I think you're all probably experienced in one way or the other, with choice of a profession. Even if I liked history and found it very interesting, and I still like to read history, I somehow did not see myself an historian. I did not see myself going and looking at ancient records, 
Mm-hmm. History was, you know, like literature. <laughs> it was fun, it was entertainment, but I couldn't see myself really doing it. So what did you think you were going to do when you signed up for graduate school in Columbia? What did you think? Well, it, it came about, I, you see, I, we went, I got to New York in 1938. It was after Hitler took over Austria. And so I went to City College because it was free. And then got my degree and was going to do chemistry and started a graduate school at uh, Penn State. And then, which some of you know, uh, came the war that was 19, uh, just 1939. Uh, and the Jap- I kind of experienced the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in Penn State. At which point, all the graduate students in chemistry got defense jobs. I didn't get one because I wasn't a citizen. So a few months later, I was in the army instead. (laughs) Because you could be drafted whether you were a citizen or not. But the army was then very good when they decided to send us overseas. We were stationed here in Baltimore. I went with some officers to a judge and I became an American citizen ahead of time because it was actually fair because they wanted to protect it, feel that their soldiers overseas should have full protection. But then I worked in a hospital lab and we had a, we had a colonel who was regular army who must have had very good connections in Washington because we always got very good places. We were stationed in Oxford. And the corresponding unit from Boston, from Harvard, from Mass General, was out in Salisbury in the sticks. <laughs> <laughs> then we moved both of our units and general hospitals moved to uh, Normandy. We worked on the tents for a little while, for a while. Then the war moved, and we got Nancy, which is eastern France and quite a decent city. And they were kind of next to us in, I forget nowhere in Metz, a much less good city. <laughs> but they were always next to us, but always in the worst position. <laughs> so when I then finished that, I had studied chemistry, but now I had done, well, clinical chemistry. All along, uh, it seemed to make uh, sense if I, I could go to graduate school now because I got, as a veteran, I had full support. And this happened. And my sister, actually, who's older than I, knew Shaga. She and her husband were friends with Shaga. And they said I should go and see him at physicians and surgeons. And I saw my uniform on and went there and introduced myself. And, well, that's the whole story. I met the head of the department, who was very impressive. Columbia then, PNS, was the leading department in biochemistry because they introduced uh, using N15 and uh, deuterium, because Schoenheimer, who was a German refugee, had had that idea, and Yuri at Columbia Chemistry Department had made these samples. And then in those days, you could only work with this stuff when you could have a mass spectrometer. And you couldn't buy a mass spectrometer, you had to build one. So when Schoenheim came and Yuri's help got a good student of Yuri's to come to PNS to run and build the mass spectrometer and do research, it was written David Wittenberg. So Columbia became a leading department in uh, biochemistry at that moment. So it uh, seemed to be uh, nice to, to go to the department. And in those days, Shaga, I had my interview with Shaga, I just introduced myself. He said, you should know Professor Clark, who was head of the department, who came in, a very impressive gentleman, and gave me a brief exam in organic chemistry, which I passed. And he said, you're now admitted to the department. <laughs> Go down to 116th Street and take advanced organic chemistry. I said, the semester has already started. Will you let me in? He said, just said, tell them I said so. <laughs> it's good old days. <laughs> I really you run. In those days, department heads were absolute rulers. Yeah. They, 
they, they were the dictators. <laughs> they had all the power. Especially in medical school. Yes, especially in medical school. Yeah. There are so many questions that one could work on in science. What drove you to choose the particular questions that you address, and how has that changed over your career? Well, it's, you know, it was not a plan. It was kind of one thing leading into another. When I was with Shagav for my thesis, Shagav had very broad interests. He started his work on sequencing, not, not sorry, well, determining sequence, not composition. Composition, composition of DNA at that time, but I wasn't working on that. And he was interested, completely unrelated, that there were isomers of inositol, which is a cyclohexane. With each carbon carrying hydroxyl group. And they're forgetting all that, eight isomers or nine isomers, depending on the position ones. And it was known from working with straight chain alcohols that a particular bug, Acetobacter, always oxidized the hydroxyl group, which was next to the primary hydroxyl group at the end, if the next hydroxyl group over was in cis position. So he said, well, that can't be in inositols because they have no primary hydroxyl group. And it was already known that in myoinositol, it, when you treated it with acetobacter, it made a monoketone. So Shagav said, look at the other isomers and see what happens. And so I started working on that. And it was got very interesting because some didn't want oxidized, some made diketones, and so on. And I came up with the idea that it was the actual structure in space. That, which is uh, both the chair form, if you wish, with a, a ring around it and so on, that determined which hydroxyl could be oxidized. So I was working with that for my thesis. So when I got the job at Harvard, I thought, OK, I'll look at the bug that can grow on inositol and degrade it completely and find out how that works. So it was a straightforward biochemical problem, which we eventually worked out. But then I discovered that that was an uh, what's now called inducible, that these cells grown on glucose or any other sugar could not in metabolize inositol. You had to grow them on inositol. So, and that was, of course, then a very interesting thing because Monod had studied his studies on uh, the LAC system and induced enzyme synthesis. So I started to start that and to try to find out. We made mutants to see whether you needed uh, ability, uh, whether an amino acid was required in these mutants, the, the one they couldn't make, to be able to adapt to inositol, which turned out to be yes. So it suggested it was proteins, regulation of protein synthesis, and so on. So in the meantime, we also got mutants that had, uh, uh, which was then a specific requirement for guanine for growth. And then I found out that they excreted xanthosine. So we then got into biosynthesis of guanine and how that branched off and so on. So it was always constantly one thing leading to another. And we had a mutant that required histidine. And then we found out that if we grew it on glucose with the energies, major energy source, it needed very little histidine, just as we expect if we just use it for protein synthesis. If we grew it with another a carbon source like in also, it seemed to need 10 times or 20 times as much histidine, which turned out to be the, due to the fact that it then made histidine degrading enzymes, and that glucose prevented that. So I got into studying what's called the glucose effect and so on. So it was then one thing always leading uh, to the next. And actually, in a specific thing, which has then been my research, for many years, which Jean mentioned, was nitrogen regulation in bacteria and in uh, eventually in yeast, came from a very simple experiment that a graduate student of mine at Harvard and Fred Neithardt, who later became quite well known for his work and was professor in Michigan, dean in Michigan. And Fred Neithardt uh, did a very simple experiment he found out that these bacteria could use histidine, uh, Klebsiella, could use histidine as a 
nitrogen source, number one. Uh, number two, the glucose, when you had grown, grown, when you were growing in a medium containing glucose, histidine, and ammonia, they did not make the histidine degrading enzymes. Whereas when you grew them on another carbon source, histidine and ammonia, they made the histidine degrading enzymes. That was the glucose effect. So he said, okay, let's see what happens if they give them glucose and histidine and no ammonia. They have now a choice. They can sit there and look stupid, <laughs> or they can grow. And Klebsiella grows, and Salmonella, Interestingly, who has also the same system, it turns out, in the same condition, sits there and looks stupid <laughs> and doesn't grow. So that then brought up the question. We looked at this first as overcoming of the glucose effect. But uh, eventually then people discovered that the glucose effect had to do with CAP, with a catabolite activating program, protein and cyclic AMP, and you could get mutants in these. And then we found, fine, when we made a mutant in Klebsiella that could not make cyclic AMP, it could not use histidine as a carbon source, because they can grow on histidine as the only carbon source, too. But it still could use histidine as a nitrogen source. So apparently, cap cyclic AMP was required for them when they use, wanted to use histidine as a carbon source, but not when they wanted to use histidine as a nitrogen source. So then we said, OK, there has to be something else that activates, prevents these enzymes to be made when histidine is used as a nitrogen source. So we started to look what else was being affected. And we found glutamine synthetase, which after all is kind of at the beginning of nitrogen metabolism. Uh, it had the similar quality to histine that when you grew cells on a poor carb nitrogen source, hist glutamine synthetase was very high. When you grew cells on a good nitrogen source, it was very low. And so we began to study that, and that led us then completely into the whole complex <laughs> system in uh, bacteria, in enteric bacteria, where there's an operon that contains the structural gene for glutamine synthetase, as well as two regulatory genes. And these genes then determine the response of the cells to nitrogen. So it was kind of a natural tradition, transition to get into that and study that, which occupied us for quite a while. And then when I had a very good student who is now Aaron Mitchell, who is now a professor at Columbia, it made also good sense to take a look what happens in yeast, because yeast has the same problem as bacteria. That is, there are lots of enzymes and permeases they need to make when they're growing on the poor nitrogen source, but they shouldn't make when they grow on the good nitrogen source, like ammonia, because they're not necessary. And that led us then into the study of nitrogen regulation in, in, uh, in yeast. And of course, the interesting result, which you could expect, is that the problems uh, uh, bacteria face, yeast face, are exactly the same. The solutions are entirely different. They come up with an entirely different way of doing it. So anyhow, that got me into that. What else would you like to know? When we were chairman for 10 years, what was the most challenging for you? Well, I think it was, uh, Gene probably remembers too, because Gene was, of course, associate head of the department. It was his great administrative ability that really helped us. This is much better than mine. And uh, the challenges were essentially uh, to decide how to build up a good department uh, in biology, it's molecular biology as the main theme, and then cell biology as an important theme. And what we decided from the beginning that we were not going to do it by trying to attract stars to the department, but to get very good young people and give them the chance to develop. And that's worked, I think, 
Uh, you came at that time. Uh, several of you here came at that time. And, uh, and uh, Phil Sharp came at that time. Uh, Baltimore, Dave Baltimore was in the department at that time. Salva particularly wanted to attract him, and we did. And so we got uh, the first Nobel Prizes at that point. Salva getting one, then, uh, then uh, the ball, Dave Baltimore, Phil Sharp, and you. So we did pretty well with that approach. Um, in the 40s and 50s, did you have to make a lot of your equipment? Or, or, or was, I mean, did you, how much could you just order? And, or did they have? I'm not a good one. I'm not a good one to answer that because I'm terribly bad at equipment. We're incompetent. We took me the incompetent at making it. And so I, I kind of only did things that didn't need very elaborate <laughs> equipment and what we needed we could buy. But people made uh, their own exchange presents in the early days. You couldn't mm -hmm. buy that kind of thing. Uh, I mean, it was amazing what you you had to make your own enzymes frequently to uh, I think Gene must have made a lot of enzymes. Did you make enzymes when you were a graduate student? That's about all I did. <laughs> <laughs> Not as a graduate student, no. as, a, as a young faculty member. Though. But I, I, I sometimes, in teaching immunology, use the, the following little story that when Rodney Porter first tried to split up the antibody molecule into pieces, he wanted to use, he used papain, but it was available only as an extremely crude preparation. And after he used it, he couldn't separate the the contaminants in the enzyme from the products. So it was several years later when somebody else had purified papain that he went back into the experiment and then could get a reasonable result. So uh, it was a, we've come a long way, and then there were no kits available. <laughs> <laughs> and we use uh, many of the techniques work. I mean, they're not that different from some of the techniques now. Were relatively uh, simple ones. We used a lot in in my work. We used a lot of paper chromatography. I mean, I learned that when Chagov started his work on separating the components of nucleic acids, and then we used the uh, paper chromatography for lots of, of different things, and then paper electrophoresis, and that finally become resolved and when you could get the, buy the kits for gel electrophoresis, which, was, which everybody still uses. And it's really a very good tool. We're, how, how do you see if there are any differences between the way that people collaborated and competed in the 50s and 60s with, versus how they collaborate or compete today? I don't know. I, I can't answer the, the question I, I, about I, changes there. And I don't know what people are doing. I can only speak of my own experience in competition. After we had done a lot of work on nitrogen regulation, I suddenly discovered that the young person I had never heard of was beginning to do the same type of experiments that I used mostly Kibzella and Cola, and she used Salmonella. And uh, that was Sidney Kustu, who is at uh, at uh, Berkeley. And then I also realized, as I met Sydney at meetings, that the only people you can talk to con intelligently about your work are your competitors. <laughs> and over the years, Sydney and I became very, very good friends. I consider her one of my best friends. And uh, uh, I said the competition went pretty well. There were things she didn't tell me. And <laughs> things I didn't tell her when they were right in the midst of doing, but otherwise we talked about things. And I have also had experience of another former uh, postdoc of mine uh, who then worked, he had not worked with me on that, into the same field, and he felt enormously competitive. And I felt rather nasty, not quoting my papers very deliberately or uh, jumping ahead at one point, he got in ahead advanced information, uh, which was legitimate. By one of my students had already done his thesis, but the results weren't published yet. <laughs> 
But of course, th thesis counts as a publication. You can get the thesis. But I still felt it was a little bit underhanded to get the thesis from MIT when we hadn't published the paper yet to get the jump on, which I considered was not a nice <laughs> thing to do. So there's competition both ways, I think. And I think everybody else has similar experiences. Boris, some of the, the connection, the interconnections between your interest in history and your interest in science are pretty evident. Were there connections between your interest in art and science? I don't think so. Uh, I, I think that that went pretty much its its own way, but just as the history also went its own way. History uh, was uh, not uh, uh, part of, of science, but just reading and literature. And collecting was just interested in art and then, of course, then also having, uh, when it came to collecting African art, for example, was having then a, also a certain interest about what these people are doing and, and why they do that. Although I never got very deep into uh, ethnology, but rather stuck to the uh, aesthetics of it. So I don't think it has, it, it uh, impinged or had any connection with science. Yeah. Speaking of history, you left Austria at a uh, very politically charged time. How did that manifest at the university? Uh, well, uh, you know, it, it what should I say? Uh, coming to the United States uh, was getting into an environment that was completely different from the polit very politically charged environment in which I had grown up. I mean, it, when I went to school, that is before Hitler, of course, took over Austria, still there was a very oppressive right-wing Catholic regime in power. And it also, in a typically Viennese way, uh, it was kind of kept a little bit nicer. <laughs> but there was a fairly good bit of brutality behind the I think. I mean, I lived to uh, two uprisings of the socialists, the social democrats against the government, which were bloodily suppressed with machine guns and cannons in the city of Vienna. And uh, uh, so it was kind of an, an unpleasant, an unpleasant time. And then it was also had this nice degree of dishonesty. For example, I knew it was known uh, when I graduated from gymnasium in '38 that one of the teachers there had been much an agent of the government. In, supposedly, there was to be an election on the still on the Austrian regime, and he told other faculty members, uh, "You could just hand your election uh, ballots to me, <laughs> and I'll put them in." <laughs> you know that sort of thing. So there was some interest after the Nazis took over of what happened to this guy. Nothing. He was also a member of the Nazi Party. <laughs> This kind of kind of corruption that was characteristic. Of, what was uh, the intellectual environment of Vienna in the twenties and thirties? I mean, was that really just really stimulating, or? Well, it it lived from uh, its its earlier earlier much livelier environment in the last uh, days before the First World War. When you know it, the intellectual environment was uh, of important people for it, of course. The writer Schnitzler, who died in the 1920s, but practically everything he dealt with was still in the monarchy. So there was still what was characteristic of Vienna, yeah, which, which I try to imagine because I'm interested, in, I like Schnitzler's writing and the things from the novels. So then one novel, particularly, and you know you get that when you read a novel. You are left and with various people you got to know in the novel. 
And then the novel ends, and these people all are making still some plans of what their life will be. One nice young officer is now retiring from the army, is going to have a uh, possession somewhere in, in Hungary and do farming and so on and so forth. And you know what all these people will do. And then you realize, of course, the novel was written in about 1912 or something like that. That then was the big First World War. Austria disappeared. What did all these people do, actually? I mean, all these dreams of having a little possession, they were definitely gone, and so on. So there was this peculiarity in Vienna, which was still noticeable when I lived there, of uh, it having kind of a been a major power in the big country, and certainly it was a very small little country with uh, not much going on, except politically the strife on the one hand, Mussolini affecting it from the south, and then Hitler affecting it from the north. So in living such, you know, like starting your career in such turbulent times, I don't know, it's perhaps from my perspective, it seems that people of my generation go in and perhaps growing up in America, we have this idea of, I'm going to do this and you're not going to be able to, you know, the government's not going to be able to tell me I'm going to be able to go off to war, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Did you really feel that you had a sense of control over your life or did you feel that you were just having to go with the flow? just? All right, now I will move here, and I will try something here, and then I will move, you know, and then, you know, and then all of a sudden you move to a new country, and they say, oh, well, you know, now you have to go to war with us, and then, you know. Well, I don't know when, when you talk about the time when I grew up. Uh, I definitely knew I wanted to study chemistry. And in Vienna in those days, it, if you passed gymnasium, which was, of course, the type of high school directed toward the university. Uh, you had automatic access to the university, so you don't have the anxiety people have here. Yes, they'll finish high school, but where will they get in? You know, you were in, in the university, so it was very straightforward. But I had definitely the feeling uh, that I would have to do some, I mean, I've finished chemistry, but I had to do then something else. The possibilities in Austria were very, very limited. It was just nothing going on, and that was also in the midst of the Great Depression. So it, it, was, it, it, it was really a depressed time. I mean, there was the feeling, yes, something will have to be done. <laughs> but it wasn't very clear what, except that uh, probably just saying, well, I'll just live in Austria and study chemistry and then get a nice job. Uh, that was not on the table. So we didn't know, we tried not to think about it. Do you have any advice for the younger generation of scientists? <laughs> well, I, I, only one piece of advice, but I think that's all given for everybody here anyhow. I feel that you should do something in your life that you really feel very strongly about. You see, I, I, I can see it doesn't have to, obviously for us, most of us, it's science or engineering or some sort. So you really have to like to do it and want to do it. And then you feel good about your life as long as you have the opportunity to doing it. Uh, the, uh, the other alternative, if you're really not interested in anything of that sort, is be interested in making a lot of money and then living <laughs> very comfortably. I don't know, I can see either one. I think uh, just trying to have a job that is only to give you enough money so you can live reasonably well, when you don't like what you're doing every day to earn the money, I think is a bad life. So, you know, if you want to live for your leisure, then at least have the aim to make a hell of a lot of money to have a very good leisure. But, <laughs> Otherwise, better do something that really makes your working day nice, so you don't just wait for getting home. <laughs> Some of you may not know this, but I think 
Doris is, has a phenomenal memory. I've always said I don't think he ever forgot anything he ever heard or learned. <laughs> I wish it were true. <laughs> I think he can tell you what Cato said at a certain time. <laughs> but but I, I, it comes with age. I, in that I may remember things long ago, but I don't remember recent things. <laughs> Our brain happens to work that way. Huh? Anybody here studying brain science? <laughs> then you should know about these things. <laughs> Something happens as time goes on. Just one follow-up to what you were talking about, the, the brutal suppression of the Jews in Europe, which then, of course, brought you to the States. But I thought it was interesting once you told me about the, the prejudice that you experienced as a Jew here, which you had not anticipated. And I thought, since no one here lived during those times, you might explain Well, that. I think that uh, was part of, of our society, and that's completely gone nowadays, pretty much as far as Jews are concerned. In Austria, certainly, there was considerable anti-Semitism. It wasn't a completely overt thing. It, it then came out once they had the opportunity. And, and certainly, uh, the Catholic right-wing regime preferred their own people. Some of the military units were pretty anti-Semitic and so on. And it got then much, much worse, of course, as soon as Hitler allowed them to do it. But when I came to the United States, there was an anti-Semitism that had not, I was not aware of, and I don't think it existed uh, to any reasonable ex to any extent in Austria or Germany. And that was when you had money and were middle class and you wanted to go to a resort or to a hotel, you got in, period, whether you were a Jew or not. And in those days, when I first came to the United States, there were many hotels and resorts that considered themselves restricted. They would not uh, accept uh, Jewish guests. And it was much more of a sort of social uh, upper class, upper middle class anti-Semitism, rather than the low class anti-Semitism of Austria Germany. And that came kind of a surprise. The, the idea that Jews, when they went on vacation, went to their own resorts and not to resorts that consider themselves restricted. Well, in academia, there were quotas for Jews. But that's uh, the very social thing. In academia, well, we all know that, and Harvard and others had sure quotas. <laughs> no, they had definitely, it, uh, I forget now when it ended, but they definitely had quotas. So, no, like, a, like you had to have at least this many, or you yeah, no, 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 no
And I mean, and in, in, I mean, the, the, I mean the, in, in Europe, I mean, there's an old uh, tradition of anti-Semitism. It was just a question of how virulent it was, and whether it took into action or was more kind of just a social thing and so on. In America, it was a very characteristic social thing. And as I said, an upper middle class thing, having to do with colleges, having to do with resorts, having to do with hotels. Even into the 50s, college application forms asked you what your religion was. Really? Yes. Yeah. And probably into the 60s, but I don't know. I think I've been dropped, uh, I lived in England for a while, and I was quite shocked in the 60s as an on postdoc. I was quite shocked when some application I filled out for housing asked my religion, because by that time in the U.S. this was not known. So that, but there was a transition from about the fifth year, and I guess in England uh, it, it lingered on longer. Well, what would happen if you said, I don't believe in any religion? I don't know. <laughs> I got turned down at three schools. <laughs> okay, can I well, see? Thank you very much. Okay. It's, uh, and thank it's, you it's, for inviting me. It's been an hour. <laughs>